Hi, Vivian. Hi, Yasmin. <laughs> I'm so happy to see you. I'm happy to see you. I want to start. We've had so many wonderful conversations over the few, the two years or so that we've known each other. I wanted to start by just hearing a little bit about your film. Just tell us what you want to tell us about Cistern. Well, uh, Cistern sort of just uh, happened in a very urgent moment in our time during uh, lockdown and quarantine in Palestine, uh, when things really started to shut down. And it was very clear that uh, we weren't going to be able to access food and uh, other things the way we did before. And then Israel started to also um, shrink the amount of uh, uh, water they were distributing or distributing, allowing us to have. And uh, so our farm started to also kind of suffer because uh, we weren't we didn't have water for a couple of months. And so I wanted to create a space uh, where it can be green, but it can also provide food for our community so that we can continue to have food, at least in this little space. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it was just kind of like a survivalist mode. Yeah. And, uh, and so I was like, I want to build a water, har a rain harvesting cistern. And I didn't have any money uh, to do it. And I didn't know where the money would come from i just knew that that's what i wanted to do and so i hired the architect i uh, got talking to the engineer and everybody a uh, team and i was like go ahead let's just do it and they started working and uh somehow the miracle was that um somebody i was talking to in california was like, so what are you up to? And I'm like, you know, I'm trying to build this cistern. And the truth is I already told people to get started and buy materials, but I don't have any money for it yet. And um, he's like, well, you know, there's an urgent fund, COVID fund, whatever for farmers. And uh, the, the cost of the cistern was gonna be around $15,000. And, and I said, well, how much is the grant? And he's like, $15,000. <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't believe you. And so it was truly a miraculous uh, event. And we started it. We had a lot of challenges uh, finishing it. But we finally did. And when we did, it was such a huge thing uh, that I, I just wanted to go in because I, I, I wanted to celebrate. And I felt like we were bringing life in our little attempt here. And so I, yeah, I, I was so glad that uh, we did. And when I went in there uh, with my friend Samar, she started filming and suddenly we have um, a film, but I just wanna say that the film also, the reason we did a film uh, not, was not just because we wanted to make a film um, Storefront TV, which is um, a gal an art organization in New York, had commissioned me to do a short piece about uh, wellness or about maintenance. How mm -hmm. are we maintaining ourselves in these times? And so for me, that just worked so perfectly to, you know, to because that is how we were maintaining ourselves. And yeah. that's how we actually plan to maintain ourselves um, very soon. And there was other things that had happened. I can tell you a bit more about it. Uh, some things we discovered while we were digging for uh, the cistern, we found these beautiful geodes, uh, literally, um, you know, crystallized under the earth and it was a sign or not a sign even like it was a testimony to how ancient the soil is there and that indeed all of this was ocean so it really brings forth the question of how humans we've declared ownership over resources we've declared ownership over so many things when in reality um all of this existed before the human species even existed so for me that was so fascinating because it really uh, helped me expand my vision beyond understanding our lives 
in the miserable moment we're in and to see that we are part of something much bigger. And in fact, we are so contemporary yeah. in, in the planet's uh, lifespan. Well, that's, I mean, I can have thought of a more beautiful introduction, even though it's a short film, you feel like the impact of all of that. And I really love the sort of idea of continuity. There's like one line in the film about that, that really made me feel the impact of the continuity of survival and water and how much it plays a part in all human life, obviously, but in this case in Palestine. So I want to jump in with a photograph, which is a very obvious one to start with. But in my experience, looking at photos with you, you just have a great gift of unpacking them with so many, uh, with so many threads. This is uh, a woman getting water from a well. And I was thinking with Cistern, I mean, you're telling us the project now came out of a necessity and a need and your work is obviously connected to agriculture. So you're already closer to some of these processes that maybe our ancestors were more familiar with and more integrated into their daily life than contemporary Palestinians are today. But how does, you know, the idea of a cistern, it's like, it seems exotic to me now hearing you talk about it, but it was actually a very like everyday thing, right? It's a necessity that was common to everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in Palestine, we are not so removed from that past in that uh, our, our current situation is still uh, urgent and it's still, um, dire in, in a lot of ways. And so water for us, uh, you know, maybe like our ancestors had more difficulty accessing the water. Uh, and that hasn't changed for us. I mean, we have new political realities that dictate how much water we get. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, humans have developed machineries that dig for water and all of that. But um, for me, I'm actually even though like the reason that I, I wanted to build a cistern and I wanted to, to even make this film was because of um, really a whole lot of pain, uh, a, a lot of pain and a lot of fear because I was getting really scared that we won't have water. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's a very legitimate fear. Um, and so, watch like looking at this picture for example there's a part of me that feels really um really proud like i'm so proud that uh, somehow i also inherited a form of resilience and creativity where you know we are harvesting rainwater we're not actually digging the earth we're not um, violating uh, the planet. We're, we're like literally like allowing ourselves to receive the divine gift of water that comes literally from the skies and, and, and just be, be so humble in front of it. Like be so, so, so humble. Yeah. In front of it and allow it to, and, and trust it and trust it. Yeah. So, you, you know, when you build a cistern, uh, which I've, I've known theoretically, but now that, you know, the winter's here, you wait for the winter. You know, we had to put water in it uh, in the beginning because it was still new and um, you have to keep some humidity and water in it, which is the water I swam in. Uh, but now it's full, but I had, we had to trust, we had to trust the rain will come. And so to watch uh, or to look at these pictures like this one, I'm, my heart really expands. Although I, I think a lot of like stories from my dad of how hard this used to be. Like this is not, this is not an easy task to carry a, a, a clay jar and put it on your head or your back and, 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 and then walk all the way down the hill and up the hill. Um, but what I'm also seeing in this picture yeah, like the terraces, for me, the terraces, and it's funny because we did end up having to do a lot of terracing around the cistern too. So, and terracing is such an amazing art that uh, has also been threatened by the way we've developed some not so healthy ways to deal with uh, soil conservation and soil, uh, um, Oh, and so um, 
yeah, so we had to also terrace and uh, it was also just so beautiful to see that you don't have to really bring so many resources from the outside. You can really, everything you need is really underneath your feet and, yeah. and, and it works together. Like collecting the stones to build the terrace uh, was so useful also for preparing the soil where for planting so it actually works so perfectly and then you create visually things that are not disturbing to the eye but things that are of the terrain itself i mean that's something that i find remarkable in general when i think about uh agricultural practices in palestine is how everything you know even when you see those pictures you see the jars that the women are carrying on their heads but of course the jar is made of of clay that's from the ground like you said the exactly. rocks that are used in the terracing are from the ground mm -hmm. it is a very it's like a remarkable thing to think of like a very small disturbance on the surface uh you know as little as possible and then this sort of like integrated thing which is not it's very different to how we think about agri not we but people in general think about agriculture as a sort of extractive process of like a of an economic process as opposed to a survival process and something that's like receiving gifts so i think in general with your work with seeds as well i always got that message from you these are like these are gifts right they're not well that's gifts. true and i mean not to be too romantic about it or about ourselves uh agriculture in itself is very violent so the 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 you know, when we started to practice plowing and uh, uh, digging the earth and uncovering it and also not trusting. I mean, I always say that uh, as much as my life has been about writing and working in agriculture field, uh, the truth is, I think that uh, the beginning of agriculture is the beginning of human anxiety, because mm -hmm. that's when we actually stop trusting that god or the universe will provide and we started wanting to store and wanting to settle and i mean i i struggle also with these questions on a personal level as someone who has a very hard time with the concept of settling yeah. and yet i i work with things that are very much requiring um uh, staying in the same place for a while well, I mean, I like what you're saying about, about that too, because I think with archival images in general, there's always that temptation to move towards nostalgia or how you said it, to romanticize the past. I think especially in the case for us as Palestinians, when so much of the past has been disrupted or our continuity with the past has been disrupted and is constantly mm -hmm. challenged, we, there's an instinct to like want to hold on to that more and romanticize it and love it and nurture it even more. But I think you're right to say, and you've corrected me before with this, where we have to be really careful about like that rom rom overly romanticizing and not thinking critically about like how we've lived, how we live now and our connection to the past. Because it's not all roses, but it's our history regardless, right? Yeah, but it's not unique to us as Palestinians. I mean, I bring this question uh, for us as a human species, especially in this time. Yeah. I think... Uh, understanding ourselves with the whatever unique circumstances of every culture uh we really also have to understand like a, a bigger picture about what have we done as as a species on, on this planet and and what are we doing now and there are things about the past obviously that are extremely important and i mean i have am romantic for me you know I, too and and there are lessons like big lessons and there are lots of things that now we keep thinking oh we want to reinvent the wheel and i'm like okay there are things that have been tried they've been tried and they work they've worked for thousands of years because they work for thousands of years yeah but there are things that are not working anymore and that is because culture is a dynamic thing and it, it changes and and we are alive and we are changing and so we do need the wisdom of the past in order for us to create a vision for the future. And I think this is where sometimes we kind of, um, we kind of like either like surrender ourselves to some idea of, of the past and like, oh, things have to be exactly like the past. And that's impossible. It's impossible to go back to the past. And to be honest with you, I don't want to go back to it. I don't want to 
carry a jar and have to go. I love taking a shower, you know, and just turning on the knob and I'm showered, right? Um, but, uh, but I think we are in front of a very important question, all of us. What do we want our future to look like? And what are we going, what threads are we going to take from the past and weave them into something new for the future? And I think these are, these images also really provide us an opportunity to imagine things that we no longer see, but maybe it's things we want to see again, or maybe things we want to modify and see again, and how would they work? And this pandemic has really offered us a moment to think about um, how important using and knowing our knowing even knowing our local resources is like when when lockdown first started i realized how lucky i am that um my mother and and the fact that i grew up in a community that actually you know was pretty rural at the time i was growing up uh that i knew the edible plants mm -hmm. so like the first two months of lockdown the first thing i did was just scout the neighborhood for, you know, what's growing where, you know? And I actually ate a lot of nettle and a lot of mallow because I was able to, and then I saved other things, you know, because especially in the beginning, we didn't know, we didn't know what it's gonna be like. Well, that reminds me of uh, a photo that I wanna share that we've talked about before uh, together, but it's sort of, um, you know, I it's it's hard because when I when I think about your ro your work, I romanticize your work a lot. Like it brings out a lot of romantic um, um, emotions and nostalgia in me as well, because you know, in my family stories, they were also on the cusp of like moving from rural agricultural life to uh, more urban life. And so I think for me, I always it's just like a personal part of my story that I'm very interested and attached to, but. There's something about like this, you know, I've told you this before about my grandfather planting seeds and, and when he moved to Colorado, bringing seeds from Palestine and planting them. And for me, growing up around these sort of vegetables, which were Palestinian, but not in Palestine, really felt like um, a sort of the growth of it and watching it felt like something really dynamic that made me feel like mm -hmm. I was living seasons in a different place. And there's something about your work that I really love, which is very joyful even though it always deals with really serious issues and realities that are very difficult. I think there's something really joyful about the way that you talk about agriculture. And I wanna show you this picture because I love this guy chilling underneath the gourds and something about it reminds me of you and your work. Yeah, you know, you, you, you know how much I've seen this picture and I giggle when I see it because I am, I am a sappy romantic, actually. I mean, I'm not like trying to, to you know, I, I try to bring myself to the hardcore, you know, reality because of things we, we have to do. But I, I mean, I am, I'm in love. I don't do this work because, oh, it's, it's the work that, I don't even do it because that's the work that needs to be done. I mean, yeah, that's definitely part of it, but I do it because I also, I'm in love, like I'm in love. And, um, and sometimes I'm in love with the leaf. Sometimes I'm in love with just the way something hangs. Um, and there is a saying in Arabic, uh, which is al farah uwe, which is which means uh, joy is power. And I've really, you know, I, I struggle a lot actually with depression even sometimes. Uh, but every, always like the joy really takes my hand and brings me out and makes me able to, 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 to have power. And so I look at this um, image and it, it brings me so much joy also because when I first saw it, I was blown away. You know, I've been working in the field for 10 years and a lot of farmers uh, would always refer to a gourd that they call it Aburakabe, which means like the father of the tall neck. Or, and um, I never, I thought like, what are they talking about? And I thought maybe they're referring to something that, um, that we have, but that's how they refer to it. And then in all the, you know, as you know, the world is, especially the Western world is experiencing a renaissance of uh, agriculture and agro 
ecology and biodiversity and whatever. And so I go to all these conferences, which are amazing, like, because all these people are bringing these ancient varieties and showing them off. And I see this um, and it makes me think of, oh, that's what my uh, friends and the elders that I talk to are referring to, but I'd never seen it. So I actually brought seeds, um, or a woman from England brought me these seeds, which is crazy um, because they actually come, you know, some of them uh, probably, you know, originally some, I don't know. I mean, I think in Italy, in Southern Italy, they grow this a variety like this also. So when you showed me this picture, I was blown away because that's exactly how they would describe like oh we would sit under the uh, you know the vine oh it was so long and beautiful and i'm like yeah whatever and then i saw this and it really connected uh the present moment and and the urgency of finding this agrobiodiversity with a real image an image of like this is this really was there and here it is, look at it. And that's really rare because in my work, oftentimes people will refer to a variety, but I have no way of knowing what it looked like, or I have yeah. no way except from description. Um, but this is an actual picture. So it was such a precious picture. And, and I love the romance of like, kind of just chilling in the afternoon. And, <laughs> and doing nothing under the shades of a vine. I mean, divine. What's missing is a cup of tea and it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, even what you said about the seeds coming back to you and to Palestine, I mean, when you planted them in Palestine from, from the UK and thinking about colonial networks that took botany to those places. And, you know, and, and that's like a, a small example of a much bigger um, process of pillaging that colonialism brought. but. It also reminds me of like, this is a picture that was taken by the American colony. Mm. It has its own sort of like colonial and orientalist narratives built into it or into the collection that it comes from. But it just mm. reminds me also how even within those things, we can find fragments that we can reappropriate and use for however we want. So for me, it makes me so happy when I find something like this that makes somebody happy and connects to their work because it's like, yes, with all the problems that come with this photograph and where we found it and who stores it and how you can access it with archives, it's also something that we can use to amplify that joy and that power, which I think those two words just beautifully sum up your film actually to me is, is joy and power. So I, I love that you brought that phrase to us in the conversation. Well, thank you, Yasin. I'd love to have a copy of that image. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, I'll send it to you now. Uh, Vivian, thanks so much for having this conversation with me. Uh, and I hope to see you soon, someplace in the wide world. Inshallah. Thank you so much, Yasin. And keep doing your beautiful work. <laughs>